this is sort of random, but I remember after college and I lived in Denver for a year and a half or something and you came out to visit. Right. And we went to a baseball game. We went to a, a Colorado Rockies game. Yeah. And that was also the first around. weekend I saw hockey ever in my whole life. <laughs> first Same. and last. First and Same. last. Well, I was like, hockey? What is that? <laughs> but I remember people around us at the baseball game started asking us questions. Like, how do you guys know each other? They were really excited and interested. And like, were you in the military together? Yeah. Like, they couldn't yeah. conceive of a space where we were just had this kind of like comfort around one another. Yeah. And it sort of it sort of triggered their their curiosity of where would that space exist. I, I, I just re- distinctly remember it being kind of like the whitest place I'd ever visited. In terms of activities, too. Like we went mountain biking. Yeah, we went never done yeah. that before. Yeah. And, and having people look at us, even your roommate. What was his name? Chip? Or Chad. Chad. OK. Like, oh, Chip, Chad. Uh, yeah, totally different. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, really nice guy. I mean, I, I think even Chad was a little like, wow, Ben's got, you know, got this black friend. I'm Khalil Gibran Muhammad. And I'm Ben Austin. <laughs> <laughs> I was giving you a runway. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't, I give myself runway. You don't give me runway. I'm Ben Austin. And I'm Khalil Gibran Muhammad. We're two best friends. One black, one white. I'm a historian. (laughs) And I'm a journalist. And this is Some of My Best Friends Are. Some of my best friends are. In this show, we wrestle with the absurdities and the challenges of a deeply divided and unequal country. Yeah. So we're going to talk today about buddies. Buddies on the big screen. Interracial buddy films. Yep. And just a heads up, Because we're talking about interracial buddy films, some of the clips contain offensive language. Let's do it. So we're going to talk about 48 Hours, and we're going to talk about other interracial buddy films today. Ain't no goddamn way to start a partnership. Now get this. We ain't partners. We ain't brothers, and we ain't friends. I'm putting you down and keeping you down until Gans is locked up or dead. And if Gans gets away, you're going to be sorry you ever met me. I'm already sorry. These buddy films were about crossing the color line, creating relationships. So that opening scene we just heard, which has, you know, this classic line, we ain't buddies, we ain't partners, and we ain't friends, which sets the moral arc of the story, which is that we're going to be buddies, partners, and friends, and we're going to do a sequel, and we're going to launch all kinds of sequels. So I think it's an important moment to think about the last 40 years since the 1980s and how we got to a moment where we're now talking about systemic racism because something about the notion of just being together didn't get us to the promised land. Yeah, yeah. Because I think this moment of talking about racism in America and systemic racism in particular, this guy asked me the other day, he found out I was a historian and he's like, oh, you teach at Harvard. You're, you're an expert. I, I've been dying to ask this. So what do you think the solution is? The first thing I said, I was like, dude, come on. I like, I studied the past, but that was just me trying <laughs> to demure from the question. And he doesn't know seriously. And I said, well, what do you think? And he said, integration, man, integration. I grew up in Jersey City. There's people everywhere from all over the world. And he said, we just need to spend more time together. Yeah. And that's what these buddy films were about. We were really shown something then that we were, we were, we were thinking about. And revisiting a movie like that now, you know, to try to to try to imagine that moment back when we were kids and what we saw. And then also this other thing, like, what do they what do they tell us now? What are we yeah. what do we learn? What do we take away from them? Yeah. So, so there are all these amazing films. There's everything from the Defiant Ones in 1958 with Sidney Poitier and Tony Curtis. Everybody lives by them. Everybody stuck with what it is. Even them swamp animals. Even that weasel. You calling me a weasel? No, I'm calling you a white man. There's In the Heat of the Night, 1967, Sidney Poitier again. They call me Mr. Tibbs. I mean, he is like, I don't know, he's the every black man in Hollywood at Hmm. that time. And he's starring alongside Rod Steiger. You got Silver Streak with Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor. I can't pass for black. Who are you telling me? I didn't say I was going to make you black. I said I was going to get you on the train. Now we got to make them cops think you're black. 
and then they, they get, get back together and stir crazy. There's also Blazing Saddles, which was uh, the first movie that, that my brother and I went to, and we looked at one another and we're like, damn, they make movies for us. <laughs> uh, and, and, then, and then we jump into the 1980s. Yeah. We got Trading Places, Dan Aykroyd, Eddie Murphy again. Nenge! Nenge Yomboko from Cameroon. Do you remember me? It's Lionel Joseph. Lionel! Yep. And uh, all the Beverly Hills Cop movies, of course, which which is when Eddie Murphy is at the, the prime of his career. Disturbing the peace, I got thrown out of a window. What's the fucking charge for getting pushed out of a moving car, huh? Jaywalking? Then in the early 90s, you get White Men Can't Jump, which is a surprisingly amazing film with Woody Harrelson and Wesley Snipes. Yep. Now, I see you hustle, man. Hey, I ain't never used no goofy white motherfucker like that. Hey, who no, you calling a goofy white motherfucker? Hey, you, you okay, goofy man, white that's motherfucker. Cool, that's cool. Yeah. There's Rush Hour, which Rush extends Hour. the genre of interracial buddy films to Jackie Chan. <laughs> There's also <laughs> Training Day with Denzel Washington and, and Ethan Hawke, a kind of another version yeah. uh, with, that inverts it's the another top version, genre. right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. It's, uh, so there. So there's a lot of films, right? It's been. This is a genre that's been going on literally for half a century. Uh, so we're going to yeah. talk about two in particular today: Forty Eight Hours, the first of Eddie Murphy's films, and also Lethal Weapon, which is yeah. a kind of a genre buster. Uh, with Danny Glover and Mel Gibson. Yeah. These films set in motion, you know, dozens of, of copycat versions. So Khalil, you 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 were talking about all the ways that you, you know, Danny Glover defies stereotypes. Do you remember that at the time at all of seeing that and feeling anything? Well, I think, I mean, yeah, I, I, I was very conscious of portrayals of blackness and black men, black people. Uh, you know, I remember watching the Cosby show like everybody else with a great sense of pride at this incredible family, the Huxtables. And so any movie that featured black people and particularly black men uh, and key characters was a big deal. I mean, I'd come off of seeing Richard Pryor, who mostly was doing comedy of one kind or another, uh, whether it was in his own films or with Gene Wilder. And these films seemed, you know, they seemed more mature, more positive. Uh, and I remember feeling that. Like I, had, I was invested in what was happening on the big screen. I think this is probably true for uh, 48 Hours, too. I mean, we don't talk about the genre of black savior films like we talk about the genre of white savior films. But that's that's the other thing that I think made these films interesting to black audiences. Well, the thing about the white character in all of these films is that for them to have the relationship with the black character, they need to be outsiders. That's part of the trope. You know, you're you're separate. You're a crazy person, a vigilante, not a team player. Like you're outside somehow white society, normal white society, and therefore you could be linked up with this black person in some way. That's why I thinking about these buddy films as black savior films, right? Because at the end of the day, white people don't need saving but for, right? Like but yeah, for yeah. Uh, the characters. Uh, Riggs, who's suicidal, Nick Nolte, who's just an asshole cop who's very selfish and himself is quick triggered and racist, right? Like he needs Eddie Murphy so he can stop being a racist cop. So these these buddy films are doing something to create space for black people in a white society that had only ever imagined them as something less than. Mm. So Eddie Murphy, Ben, I mean, of course, he was for our generation what Richard Pryor had been to our parents' generation and what Dave Chappelle has been for a whole generation of young people who are younger than us. Yeah, yeah. The black comic translator of all the racist myths and mythologies and absurdities in America. And that's part of the excitement of 48 Hours. It's his breakout role and we know him already. But it, it was just part of my coming of age experience in Hyde Park um, and being, you know, at the local theater. And of course, you and I ended up working. Literally, we met the next year after that movie and worked next door at Hyde Park Computers. The theater and the, the computer store were almost contiguous. And yeah, and seeing movies there was a big deal. 
Yeah. So that movie, I think, is really powerful because it is so steeped in racism. Like You're talking about 48 hours. 48 hours. I mean, yeah. it is It is in your face. I mean, if Lethal the, Weapon the first, was the colorblind the, version of this, 100%. right? This is yeah. just the opposite. Yeah, so this is very much a Hollywood film. Joel Silver produces this film. Maybe it's his first one, and he ends up producing actually Lethal Weapon and a million other movies. But there's something that still feels really unique about this and different from other films. There's all this racism in the film, but it feels like it's an analysis of racism and race rather than being racist. Oh, absolutely. From the very first moment, the f- opening scene is, you know, uh, where one guy breaks another one out of prison, and the whole way he does it is by saying racist things against him as a, as a Native American. Right. It's from the very opening lines. You got a big mouth, convict. Take it easy, Chief. He's only joking. Okay. Can I have the water, please? Fire water, Tonto. Is that what you mean? Fire water, huh? (laughs) Yeah, there's that line, fire water, Tonto, right? So so Eddie Murphy is joined in this league, this band uh, of criminals um, that includes two white guys, an Indian, and a black guy. It's kind of like one of those jokes, right? Like, (laughs) what, what happens when two white guys, an Indian, and a black guy get together and rob a bank? And so that's like the conceit of the film, Out the Gate, and uh, the racism directed towards the character, what was his name? Billy? Yeah, Billy, the, the Native American guy. Yeah. Billy. Like, yeah, yeah, Billy. Um, is just, it, I mean, it's, it, it's jaw dropping from the beginning. And so, partly what I'm thinking about seeing that as kids um, is how commonplace it was to play to this racist humor. Um, and these stereotypes, right? Yeah, saying it felt like that race is always present and on people's minds and people talk about it and people worry about it and people joke about it and it's there at every moment. And it doesn't necessarily lead to racism, but you don't pass up a moment to mention it or to joke about it or to nudge something about it. Yeah, I mean, the humor the humor is dramatized, so it's not meant for laughs, right? It, it's like we all know this is how we really think and talk about each other. So, so we're going to lean into that. In fact, Nick Nolte's character, I mean, he, you know, he opens as this kind of, you know, working stiff cop who's sleeping with this woman. You know, he's noncommittal. It's just about the sex. Uh, and it's just another day on the job. And this day happens to be one where he's going to end up getting some black guy out of jail to solve a crime. Um, but the first thing, you know, out of his mouth, basically, uh, within the conversation when he meets Eddie Murphy shortly after he basically says, I need your help, is, you know, I thought you were a smart boy. Like, yep. I mean, it, and he says it all, just shy of a Southern twang. Oh, man. it, it I mean, I, I, I it, it goes from boy, jive. He calls him a spear chucker. He says <laughs> you, um, what was the, he calls him watermelon at one point. Yeah, later says, on, I, yeah. He calls him a chocolate colored loser. And then and then finally it like builds, 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 and they have this scene where they get in a fist fight, he uses the N word. It right. like I mean, he goes to places you're like, watermelon, damn. Like <laughs> spear chucker, like in another actor, it you know, if if you had Mel Gibson saying those lines, it would have come across totally differently. There's mm-hmm. something about about uh about Nick Nolte's racism and like also like he's this giant hulking guy and so shabby and worn out and like his lines are delivered with a weariness you know it's not like he's not there's not like a spit edge to them he's just like he's just falling apart yeah well I, I again i think he's also standing in as this irish cop like he he has a proverbial irish cup of coffee he pulls out yeah. his flask and drops a little whiskey in it um before he gets his day started and his racism is dripping from him, which is a way of kind of signifying that the moral arc, right, of his experience is going to be coming to terms with how shitty he is as a person to Black people. And, and all that's inside of him that Eddie Murphy stands in as this canvas for him to spew on. Uh, including, as you pointed out, this line over, he calls him literally an overdressed charcoal colored loser. 
Um, yeah. But the truth is, he is himself a loser. His <laughs> well, but he, <laughs> but he, but he is right. Nobody likes this guy. So, so that that idea. I mean, I hadn't even thought of the film in a way as a black savior movie. Um, mm-hmm. And there's this there's there is this amazing moment when they're in the black bar, and Nick Nolte's character essentially apologizes for all the racist things he said. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't mean that stuff. I was just doing my job, keeping you down. Yeah, well, doing your job don't explain everything, Jack. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> as long as you feel like Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> Which at first I was like, I, I confused it with with George Washington. Was it telling the truth? And I was like, oh no, he means freeing the slaves. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. the the idea that you know, in his raspy, weary voice, he says all the words again and apologizes. I was just doing my job, holding you down. And Eddie Murphy's line is amazing. You know, doing your job doesn't explain all of it. Right. And he Jack, says, yeah, yeah, you're right fuck like (laughs) like like and then it's so like real and crazy that this is actually happening in this in this buddy movie that eddie murphy has to like deflate it with his laugh Uh, uh, uh. (laughs) right no it was i agree it was incredible uh and i mean this is this is where i think the film is groundbreaking for taking head on how so many Americans are thinking about these issues in this moment. Yeah, you're right. You know, one of the things that this film does powerfully that, say, Lethal Weapon doesn't do at all, it actually shows them develop a relationship. They actually do connect. And then there's the sense, too, of like the other kind of male bonding of doing a job well, that they both live by a code. You know, that their sense of this being, you know, your pluck, and your ingenuity. When Nick Nolte defends him against the chief, he says, he might be a convict, but he's the smartest partner I ever worked with. Right. That's, that's a big part of what you're talking about, which is that, that their authentic relationship has, has to rise above the normal rules that apply in a society that's broken. Yeah. They, maybe that's a good, good moment to talk about that that bar scene, the, the probably the yeah. most famous scene in the movie. Yeah. So this scene, you know, they're they're going in to find out where this guy Billy is, and they they know that he used to bartend there, and they walk into this bar, and it is just like some fantasy land of, as they say, redneck bar. Mm-hmm. Like the first shot, you hear these fiddles. It's like the Charlie Daniels band, and you see a woman on stage dancing to like fiddles going nuts. Every single person in there is white and is wearing a cowboy hat. And there are Confederate flags everywhere. everywhere. Like, and it just goes from con- small Confederate flag, bigger, <laughs> big Confederate flag, bigger Confederate flag. Right. And, and so the first line that Eddie Murphy says, Not a very popular place with the brothers. My kind of place. Always like country boys. They're sure as hell gonna like you. Eddie Murphy, the work that he does in this scene, just, it's masterful. Right. But it also it, it's also the moment where Eddie Murphy embodies the actual f- power of policing. Yes. Right. Yes. So that's that's a moment where Nick Noti sees a version of himself and realizes how much power and privilege he actually has. Yeah. So before they go into this honky tonk bar, Eddie Murphy's character, Reggie Hammond, says to Nick Nolte's character, Jack Cates, mm. the thing that gives you power is your badge. I could get the information if I just had a badge. And Nick Nolte, he says, no way, you know, I'm a great cop. I know what I'm doing. And so they make a bet. And he says, I'll give you my badge. And you can, you can try to see if you can get the same information out of these people. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's such a powerful moment in the film because hmm. to, to anyone's surprise, no one has seen a, film, a moment like this in a, in a Hollywood scene. This is probably... This is probably top 10 scene for for groundbreaking use of comedy to illustrate some of the most powerful social forces in society, including how much the intersection of race and policing matter in our society. Damn. 
You're yeah. like you're it's like this is Orson Welles level shit right here. <laughs> <laughs> you're like this is this is up there. Yeah, yeah. All right, listen up. I don't like white people. I hate rednecks. You people are rednecks. That means I'm enjoying this shit. Yeah. So uh, uh, okay. So like that is the moment where Eddie Murphy fully embodies Nick Nolte's power. Yeah. He 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 literally turns he he basically collides the power of policing with the power to be racist because yeah. he can do anything to these people and and they can do nothing about it. You know what I am? I'm your worst fucking nightmare, man. I'm a nigga with a badge. I mean, I got the mission to kick your fucking ass whenever I feel like it. And that that is the slavery metaphor playing out in this moment. Which yeah, Nick Nolte, yeah. and what I love about the scene is, it's also the moment where Nick Nolte is watching this. The camera comes back to Nick Nolte time and yeah, time again yeah. so that he can see with his own eyes what he has been doing to people. Yeah. And maybe, maybe like he sees it, but he doesn't, it doesn't sink in yet. But well, but no, it's but it's there part, because, it's part of the yeah, process. It's part right? of his growth. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we should take a look then at how this notion of power and privilege moves out of Eddie Murphy to another movie that Joel Silver makes five years later, another interracial buddy film, another cop action film. And this time, Danny Glover plays the straight guy. And he's the cop in charge. He's Sergeant Murtaugh. And all of a sudden, all these stereotypes are completely inverted. He's a family man. He's cautious. He's played by the rules. He's 50 years old, thinking about retirement because he's already done his 20-year bid. And he gets this crazy-ass lunatic white guy as a partner who's played by Mel Gibson. Fascinating. So the premise of, of Lethal Weapon is, you know, Danny Glover's c- character, Murtaugh is his name, Roger Murtaugh. It's Murtaugh. 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 Yeah. Uh, he's a cop. I'm too old for this shit. And, you know, he he's, guess he's near retirement or something. Like, he just turns 50. And, and in he, cop years, you know, that's like 25 yeah. good years on the force. Yeah. yeah. So he's, you're, he's you're, at that age. You're getting age. close to done. They, they're yeah. on the LAPD. And he gets this renegade partner, you know, the outsider, not the team player, you know, mm-hmm. and, and somebody who they think is suicidal. And it's Mel Gibson. Right. Now, that's a real badge. I'm a real cop, and this is a real fucking gun. Who, who turns out to be a little crazy in the end. I mean, you, when we saw it, do you think of it as like a, in a, 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 an important film in any way of seeing like interracial, you know, males bonding in some way? Yeah. Did you remember yeah. it that way? I did. Yeah. Well, the thing that struck me on seeing it now, because I also remember just just the imagery of seeing the the movie posters and seeing the the VHS box all the time, of thinking like that it meant something, and seeing it now is how little it's actually an interracial film. The cast is it's a black man and a white man, but that race, you know, it's almost like the idea of I don't see color, like that's that's the story of the film. That yeah. there's no actual writing or very little where they're interrogating race, uh, where they're thinking about it, where they're asking about it. It's not present. They're not actually interested in one another. They're, they're, you know, it's just a sketch of, uh, of, of the story. Like they don't, they don't really bond over anything beyond the surface and they don't exist in terms of their racial identities. They just exist in the, you know, in the present to do action. See, see this is where I would disagree. So I think that whether it was deliberate in the script writing or whether it was in the casting itself is a commentary on race. I mean, first of all, Danny Glover is a socially conscious actor. Second of all, he, he basically inverts every stereotype in his role. Now, the truth is, had it been a white guy, we wouldn't necessarily be able to make this commentary. But I think it matters to the viewer. It matters to the audience that the boss of this film is the black guy. The guy who's the family guy is the black guy. The guy who is representing black cops 
at a time when black cops are still being killed by fellow officers when they're off duty um, and are forming organizations to try to fight against racism inside of law enforcement. It matters that he's the one in that really powerful scene when they're investigating the the murder of, of the woman who died in the opening scene and they go up to that group of kids. Come on, man, you can't say that's not about race. Is that a real gun? Yeah, yes, this is a real gun. Do you kill people? No, if some guy's hurting someone, I try to shoot him in the leg or something, just to stop him. Mama says police misshoot black people. Is it true? Uh, yeah, is it true? Is that true? Yeah, is it yeah, true? Is that true? Is it true? Uh, maybe we yeah, uh, get the kids some true? ice cream. Is I- I- ice cream? cream? You like ice cream? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ice cream. Ice cream. Yeah. I-, I think that that is such a powerful scene in this film. Uh, because it didn't, it just didn't have to happen. It did not have to happen. N- nothing about that brief moment with those kids had to go there, other than the need to acknowledge that there was this larger social reality happening, uh, and that those kids were bearing witness to it. Um, I don't dis. We were kind of saying the same thing. Like, like there's a there's a symbolism of their presence, but it's very rarely written into the script and meaning. And so there's a scene later where, um, you know, the, the special forces guy shoot Riggs, Mel Gibson, and Murtaugh's daughter has been kidnapped. And he's running around the streets of L.A. holding a gun, his shirt off. He looks crazy. And police are pulling up. And never is there a moment like, oh, shit, they right. might shoot him. That's right. And, and, and 48 hours, it's like every moment, the, you know, cops feel up like, we're going to shoot this motherfucker. Right. And you always feel that. And so it's sort of race blind at different times. And yet there's this symbolism. And so but, the daughter, they're like, they live in some neighborhood and you're like, all right, that's interesting. But they don't discuss that in terms of what it means for them to live in that neighborhood. The daughter is going on some date with a white boy, you know, that he says blonde hair. That's not an issue. Um, they don't, they don't really talk about it. But then there are these two moments when they, they try to script in some race. And one is at the dinner table where they beatbox. And this is like some white Hollywood version of like, well, what would a black family do if they're, you know, at dinner? I think they're going to beatbox. And then they rap. I'm going to find a father because my name is Roger. And I need to be Maja. And a sick queen of Haja. And a hoota hoota hoota. The point is that... Yeah that they actually don't have, like, oh my gosh, black people can't all naturally rap. I don't know if you notice this, but uh, you can see on their fridge, uh, like, an uh, end apartheid sticker. Oh, I totally saw it. Th- this is why you and I are not agreeing on this, because I think this is the Reagan era. This is an era no. of, I mean, re- no, listen, Reagan appoints um, several key black people in cabinet positions, like, basically building the base of a kind of black conservative movement that is very much about colorblindness and seeing people as individuals. This is the zeitgeist of the Reagan moment. That's so the this whole film, point. This film is like part of that brainwashed. I agree with you. It's like, for the most part, it's not exploring that idea. It's not, you know, it doesn't have a lens. It, it surfaces at a couple moments like this. But for the most part, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not thinking about their racial identities. They're not discussing them. Mm-hmm. So then I'm going to talk about the very end of the film. And okay. what you're saying, because so, you know, I mean, the premise doesn't really matter in a way. It's like just a MacGuffin, as they say, it's set up, you know, there's, there, there's a murder, there's some drugs, they have to stop it. Then the the bad Vietnam special forces guys are trying to kill them. And so one of these guys played by Gary Busey is the other special forces. And then he and Mel Gibson have this fight on Danny Glover's suburban lawn at the very end. Yeah, because he's he you know, they need revenge. And in some absurd way, they, all the police are like, you know, even though he's murdered all these people, let's let them fight, like fist right. fight, as like, right. you know, to work this out like man to man. And this is such a man world. And, and so, you know, in the end, Mel Gibson is getting, he's getting beat up. He takes his shirt off, you know, purposefully. Like he's, he's you know, this is Mel Gibson. It's raining. He's wet. He has this mullet, like a long mullet, you know, curly mullet. Uh, and, you know, he's getting punched, but he's punching back and he, he ends up knocking this guy out and the police are arresting him. Mm-hmm. And But then Gary Busey, you know, does a jujitsu move and pulls a gun from one of the officers. And at this point, Mel Gibson uh, 
is with his shirt off and soaking wet and exhausted. And Danny Glover has draped him in a blanket and is holding him into his chest. Total, you know, total buddy moment, dude. Like, so, this is the culmination. So, this is the culmination of a movie that is in conversation with other buddy films where let me, let me they finish, start. Cause, no, cause man, I got I to gotta set this up right because the film starts in classic buddy film fashion with them saying, we are stuck with each other, right? And the yeah. culminating scene that you're about to describe is the full narrative arc of that relationship. Yeah. So culmination is the right word because it's totally orgasmic. It's actually the two of them coming together. Right. Uh, <laughs> like, like he is he is naked. Mel Gibson exhausted. He's draped in a blanket on Danny Glover's chest, holding him, and he says, "You know, I got you, buddy. I yep. got you, buddy." <laughs> and then Gary Busey. It turns out that he has a gun on them, and they both hold up their guns simultaneously. And and you know shoot one That's after right. the other. No, I I we we totally agree on that. And that that is the story of Cold War Reagan America, right? Our enemies are foreign, not domestic. Yeah. We as individuals can rise and succeed mm. in this nation if we are hardworking, if we are family people, if we love on our kids, if we don't do drugs, if we show restraint. That is the moment where, how does it end, right? Because the next scene is a family scene. The yeah. next scene after this as orgasmic embrace of this black guy and white guy. And interestingly enough, of course, Danny Glover towers over Mel Gibson, right? You know, he is oh, he, the black he, he, mammy figure him, in this yeah. moment, right? Yeah. The next scene is them going back to his house and inviting Riggs into the home with his dog, Sam, um, to join the family in a holiday meal. That yeah. is the closure of Cold War America, right? Yeah. We are cops. We kill bad guys. We do this together. We are in this together. So what's obvious about these films is these are films for white audiences, um, for white men who are making these films and imagining that liberal Hollywood is talking to white guys around America who, you know, who who are having very isolated, yeah. segregated, all white experiences. And so as a white guy, uh, what do you think these films uh, tell us as we look back and thinking about our own relationship and coming of age in the 1980s? Yeah, I mean... I, I also tried to watch these movies and see whether I saw myself in them. You know, definitely, definitely not in Mel Gibson. You know, but I, I do think it is that sense of redemption that you talked about. There's something comforting in them, right? Like that's how we're You mean we're white redemption, redemption for white men. Right? That that the the sense of, you know, coming together is also a sense of, you know, the the country's ideals being realized in a way that also isn't you know, it's not like the social order is being transformed. Right. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, you don't have to give up very much to see this piece. Right. Um, in fact, you gain a friend and yeah. that's, if that's all it takes yeah. to, to have a, a better society, that you have a new buddy and that everyone likes you, yeah. you know, that, that, that the, this is a very easy version of racial reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. So, I mean, we are in this present moment of these la the last several years where people have been called to account. Mm -hmm. and, and so looking back on these movies from our youth and are wrestling with race and racism and where white people are looking at themselves and looking at a system. And it's a look that often people are avoiding because it's uncomfortable. But sometimes you almost, all you have to do, I guess, is is the nod or the corporate sponsorship or or the the like on Twitter. And that feels somewhat equivalent to to these movies. I don't know that we were they weren't revolutionary for sure. No, but I mean um, I mean to you to not about us. I mean like if we're thinking about what what do we make of these films and the role they've played 
and how people were socialized, you know, in the course of our coming of age, right? So we are 50, basically. Um, I mean, I am a little younger than you, of course. You're, you're, yeah, you're 50, yeah. I'm 49. But the notion that seeing these films or watching MTV or playing on a sports team with Black people or having one in your band was, was enough. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's... Well, I think that's yeah. I think that's what 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 I learned looking back on these films. Yeah, that it, yeah. it wasn't enough. It, it may be necessary in a way uh, to create possible mm-hmm. relationships that would change our politics and and rewrite the rules of our society. But yeah, not enough. And that's one to grow on. Yeah, man. Well, I learned a lot about how we were supposed to be buddies. By watching these films again, friends and partners, friends, yeah. You say we were we were friends, partners, and buddies. I mean, you know, on the tennis court, we were never friends or partners. Basketball. That's the line that that's the line that starts their their interaction. We ain't brothers, we ain't partners, and we ain't friends. Yep. And then I got all, that. That's what I have tattooed on my arm. It's it all came together in, in a loving brotherly embrace. Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Case closed. <laughs> All right, love you. Love you, man. Some of My Best Friends Are is a production of Pushkin Industries. The show is written and hosted by me, Khalil Gibran Muhammad, and my best friend, Ben Austin. It's produced by Cher Vincent and edited by Karen Shakurji. Our engineer is Martin Gonzalez. Our associate editor is Keishel Williams. And our showrunner is Sasha Mathias. Our executive producers are Lee Tal Molad and Mia LaBelle. Special thanks to Eddie Murphy. You've been formative to our lives. Thanks to my wife, Stephanie, who was our sharpest listener on this episode, and Matt Couturel, the biggest movie watcher I know who helped with research. At Pushkin, thanks to Heather Fain, Carly Migliori, John Schnars, and Jacob Weisberg. Our theme song, Little Lily, is by fellow Chicagoan Avery R. Young from his amazing album, Tubman. You will definitely want to check out more of his music at his website, averyryoung.com. You can find Pushkin on all social platforms at Pushkin Pods, and you can sign up for our newsletter at pushkin.fm. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen. If you love this show and others from Pushkin Industries, consider becoming a Pushnik. Pushnik is a podcast subscription that offers bonus content and uninterrupted listening for $4.99 a month. Look for Pushnik exclusively on Apple Podcast subscriptions. You got a hot mic? Hot mic. I'm ready. As 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 uh, we say on the golf course, is your motor running? That's I don't like, know what that means. That's when you're I ready. Don't, I don't. That's when you're ready. No, yeah, whatever. I don't fuck with that's golf. when you're ready. You grew up. You grew up. You grew up three blocks. Exactly. From the golf and we were. My father told exactly. me. He said to me, "We are not people who play golf." He said that to me. <laughs>